Hello. So hopefully people aren't in too much of a food coma. Um, so this is Rails 5, the features you haven't heard about. Also known as Sean dramatically reads the change log for you on stage. <laughs> Not really. Um, my name is Sean Griffin. I am a committer on Ruby on Rails. Uh, I'm the maintainer of Active Record. I recently have been doing a lot of work in Rust and create it, uh, creating an ORM over there, and I have a podcast. And uh, what I actually want to share with you isn't so much about the features, but uh, I want to talk about the stories that went into implementing them, why they exist, in some cases why it took so long to, uh, uh, to add them or why they didn't exist in the past. That, that whole sort of thing. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is called the Typed Attributes API. And it's, it's got a very special place in my heart because it is the feature that got me into Rails and that uh, I've been working on for about two years. Uh, I gave a much more in-depth talk about, the, about it at uh, RailsConf 2015. And if you're interested in some of the details of, of um, how it actually works and all that, you, uh, you can uh, watch that talk. But I've never really told the story of how that that API came into existence. Um, so it started with a project. I was working for ThoughtBot at the time, and uh, we had there was a there were some recurring themes I was seeing in applications that led up to the need for the need for the attributes API. But there was one that I really liked to point at uh, as the catalyst, and it had this this uh, requirement that all data be encrypted on the database at rest, including if the database was actually um, uh, compromised directly. Uh, so we were using a, a gem called Adder Encrypted originally, and Adder Encrypted uh, creates code that looks like this. You call the Adder Encrypted class macro um, on your active record subclass. It assumes that on the database you have a column called encrypted secret thing, and it creates an, uh, an accessor for the unencrypted version, does all of the encryption and decryption in Ruby land. So you just say secret thing equals something, and then when you read it back out, it'll unencrypt it, but the uh, encrypted secret thing field will be nonsense. Uh, the problem with this is that it doesn't work with methods like where or find by. So if you try to do something like this, it just won't create a query that actually does anything. Uh, and you'll get an error about that column not existing. Um, it does give you an escape hatch in the dynamic finder methods that we uh, used to have and see a lot more of before Rails 3. So you could still call find by secret thing and that would work. Uh, but that's not really how we write code in Rails anymore. Uh, and there's other ways that you, all, that you want to do queries besides just finding by, by that column specifically. Um, that feature of Adder Encrypt is also deprecated and is going to go away, I, I learned when I was, re when I was looking at, uh, at it again for this talk. Um, and in this particular project, we actually needed to use a Ransack to create a, a more complex search form. And we were doing things like light, uh, light queries. And what we ended up doing was um, monkey patching ARL. And when we walked the AST, looking for uh, binary nodes for the left-hand side was one of these columns, and then changing the right-hand side. Uh, and that's not a thing I would recommend that anybody do ever. <laughs> So uh, I went and saw a talk shortly after that project by this guy named Ernie Miller. Uh, and he was talking about some of the horrors of uh, Active Records internals. And one of the things he pointed to was how nice it would be if Active Record, when it inferred the structure of your model from the database schema, if it was actually just calling public API for you and there was a nice method underneath that you could use. Uh, and so I agreed a lot with, with what he was saying, and it sounded a lot like what had sort of been uh, going through my head at the time. Um, so I ended up going off and implementing it, and it required a lot more work than I anticipated. Uh, it, getting the actual feature to, to, uh, to be added was very, was actually very quick, but getting to an implementation that we were happy with was a thing that, that took, that required rewriting a significant portion of Rails internals. Basically everything except for, uh, except for associations got touched by this, and ARL as well. Um, so this is, this is what the, uh, that, that project might look like if it were using the Attributes API today. Um, the Attributes API is a class macro that takes two arguments. The first one is the name of the attribute, and the second argument is a type object. Uh, the type objects have pretty simple APIs that involve going from user input to Ruby land, Ruby land to database, and database to Ruby land. Uh, and in this, in this case, this sort of expo uh, shows why I wanted to have it be focused around objects and not another DSL with symbols and registries. 
because you might want to have constructor arguments. In this case, you need a, a key to encrypt with, and I injecting that will make that object very easy to test in isolation. Um, and this thing is universal, so it affects where, it affects find by, anything that could ever perform type coercion is going to go through the attributes API. Um, and that, but that was the easy part. The harder part was internally getting the code to look like this. So this is 100% of the code now um, for Rails inferring your uh, model structure from the database schema. Uh, it's just going to loop through, the, this, will ha this happens immediately after we load the schema, and it's just going to loop through the columns hash. And define attribute is just like attribute, but strict instead of lazy. Um, and we're, we're ju we just go and figure out what the right type object is based on, based on that column, but we're just calling that public API for you, and it's very simple code now. Um, so this was, this was the end result that I was really happy with. Uh, so I don't want to talk too much about the, the attributes API because I've already given an entire talk on that, but I did want to cover a little bit of the story. But now it's something that people will care a little bit more because we have the most frequently requested feature in Rails 3. And it's finally arrived in Rails 5. I'm personally most excited about it. Active support left pad. <laughs> now, Now we think that this feature is so critical to the Ruby community at large, not just to uh, Rails users, that we are actually going to be shipping this as a separate gem and not part of Rails itself. So don't worry, everybody can depend on it. We'll be good. Um, <laughs> okay, now so, so for the real feature actually, uh, it's active record, active record relation or. Six years after relation was introduced, you can finally add an or expression to your where clause. Um, and other, and other libraries have had this for a while, so one of the big questions is why did this take us so long? Uh, it seems like a no-brainer to add. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the, the most obvious one, though, is that, or the biggest reason that it took so long was that the, the right API for this wasn't uh, as obvious as you might think it was. So one thing that, that people tend to forget when they're submitting new features to open source is that it's incredibly difficult to change or remove a feature after it's been added. We couldn't just settle for something that, hey, it'll, it'll let me build an OR query if we're not really confident it's the right API and will, be the, and will continue to be the right API years down the line. So we needed to be confident that we got to the right, the right solution. So this is what we ended up uh, landing on. So it's a method on relation, and it takes another relation as an argument. <laughs> so this is what it might look like. Here we've got uh, a new named scope. We're calling it for the uh, front page. We're going to get the recent articles or articles that have been pinned. And each of those have an individual named scope that is being reused in the for front page uh, method. And this was really what we were focusing on and why the API is exact, specifically that signature, because we wanted to optimize for named scopes. Or, to put it another way, we wanted to optimize for composition and abstraction. We wanted you to, uh, if you've got something on one side of an OR clause, you're probably reusing that piece of the query elsewhere. There were a lot of other proposals for this API. Uh, one of the most common ones was just this. Uh, it was still a method on relation, but it would take a hash instead of another relation. Uh, but it, this has a couple of problems with it. The biggest one is that OR by itself doesn't actually imply anything about a WHERE clause or can also exist in a having clause. Relation represents an entire set. If you're thinking about it from a set theory uh, point of view, it's actually completely <laughs> reasonable to think or would represent a union. So uh, then some people would say, okay, let's disambiguate. Let's have it be dot where dot or. Um, these, are oft these were often the same people who were saying that we should have a dot where dot less than. Uh, but this doesn't achieve our goals for the API. It, it doesn't help with that code, reuse, uh, that code reuse and the ability to work well with named scopes. So um, there, there's some trade-offs with what we landed on. Uh, if you're using it from outside of the model, it, it, for, if you're using it from a controller, more importantly, self isn't the model class, it can get a little bit verbose because you're having to repeat the name of the model over and over again for each thing that goes into the relation. Uh, it's even worse if you're just trying to do a one-off. If you actually don't want to reuse it and you just need to call where once, uh, then it can look like this, and that can be a little funky. But at the end of the day, the trade-off there that I, uh, that I think we've landed on is we're encouraging you to give names to these concepts and to abstract things in a way that your code's easier to reason about. So I'm pretty okay with it. <laughs> so now let's talk about something completely different. Show of hands, how many of you periodically do this? 
We point our, our database URL at a production database and drop it. I mean, it's pretty common, right? It happens all the time. Um, no, but seriously, this actually does happen all the time. Uh, it's it's it more, more likely what, what ends up happening is people are pulling down the environment variables from their production data uh, or their staging uh, server, and they're forgetting to unset database URL, and then they run their test suite. If you're using a, something like Database Cleaner, which uh, will go in and delete all of the data in your database at the end of every test, then you have a very awkward conversation with your ops people. Um, so this one actually had a pretty obvious solution from the get-go. Let's just remove database URL. If you actually want that, you can use ERB in, config, uh, in, in the config file. Um, but by default, let's just not have that happen because there's a lot of people who aren't using the database URL uh, environment variable, and certainly they're not using it in development mode. But uh, the problem with that is, we're, what, what I'm also saying when I say that is, uh, let's break Heroku, because this is what they use to, to work. Um, so Richard Schneeman, who, who works for Heroku and is also on the Rails team, got everybody together uh, to think about alternate solutions. And he put a ton of time and effort into finding a way to fix this problem. Um, what we ended up doing is a little bit more complex. What, what we do is uh, Active Record now maintains an internal general metadata table that we can, uh, we're going to be using a bit more in the future as well. It can store things like what was the, what was the last version of Active Record do we access this with? Do we need to do any cleanup uh, in, in, the, in the plumbing for that? Uh, in this case, what we do is we keep track of what the, uh, what the environment, uh, what environment you've run database commands on. So when you run your migrations, we basically just say, okay, and we know that this database is your development database or your production database. And when an action that is going to be destructive is run, we just go look and see, hey, does this, uh, is this either A, unset, which you might see if you try and run your tests without uh, running migrations first or something uh, immediately after upgrading to Rails 5. Um, but most importantly, if the variable is set and it's a different environment than what we're running in, that's probably not what you meant to do. So we give you a big warning. You'll see something that looks like this. Um, and we'll just tell you, hey, this might be a bad idea because you're trying to, this was me trying to run my tests <laughs> against the uh, development, uh, against my development database. Um, and there's, a, there's an escape hatch if you really did want to do that. It's an, enable foot gun equals true. I don't remember the exact variable. Um, but basically you'll need to say that, uh, yeah, I really want to do this. So if we've done our job right, this is actually a, fe this is a feature that you'll never see. Um, but out of the box, Rails 5 is doing some additional work now to help prevent a mistake that was much more common than you would think and was catastrophic if, if it ever occurred. So hopefully you never see it, but Rails, 5, but Rails 5 is gonna help save you from some very silly things. So we've also got migrations. And there's a question that isn't talked, asked or talked about terribly often. <coughs> you can still run migrations from two years ago, right? Right guys? What could possibly go wrong? Um, the problem, so the problem with migrations is that we do make, we make changes over time. If you've ever accessed, if you ever use a model in, in your migrations, that can also be a problem because the code in your model changes independently of the, uh, of the database schema. But we actually do want to make changes to the, to the migrations API. Uh, we try, we've been, we've, as a result of the fact that migrations are code that tends to be written against one version of Rails, run significantly later and isn't frequently tested, it was a very common place where if we make a breaking change, it has very unexpected effects. And so we just had to avoid making any changes in behavior to the uh, migrations API at all. But as we've added support for things like foreign keys, uh, the behavior around uh, belongs to has changed a bit so that we assume that it's required. So we want to uh, in references in your migration DSL, we want to have null false there by default because that's the direction that we've been pushing. And what ends up happening is if in 4.2, if you generate a new migration, uh, especially if it has a uh, belongs to or references in there, you'll notice there's like 20 options at the end. Uh, and that's because we want to change the default behavior. 
uh, if for no other reason than to take advantage of new features that we think should be on by default, like foreign keys, but we can't actually change the, the default behavior because that causes pain for people. And it's, a spe it's significantly worse when you're looking at an application like Discourse or like Manage IQ, both of which are Rails apps that are deployed separately. They don't have a single production environment like most applications do. They write the code and then they have other people, everybody has their own Discourse deploy. And if you upgrade mul through multiple versions at once, it's entirely possible that uh, a migration gets written against one version and Discourse releases a new version with, with that migration and then a customer skips that, that version of Discourse. And the next version of Discourse, they upgrade to a new version of Rails and now that migration does something completely different but it never got run on that machine. So uh, what we end up doing now is when we generate migration, you might notice if you've tried this in the beta, you'll see a 5.0 there. Um, so we're just keeping track of the version of Rails that you wrote a migration against, and we're going to give you a different API depending on what that number is. If it's not there, we assume 4.2. We can't really do anything about things before we added this feature. So right now it'll just be not there or 5.0. And this is gonna improve things. It's gonna give us a little bit more freedom and it'll help, uh, it'll help make migrations a little bit less of a, of a hazardous uh, place for people, but it's not a free feature. Because what, what we're doing when, uh, with this feature is we have agreed to maintain every version of the migrations API from 4.2 until the end of time. And while that's not your problem, it's my problem, um, it is everybody's problem because when we have a larger surface area, there are going to be more bugs. Because open source maintainers aren't magic. Uh, we don't have infinite free time and we don't magically produce code that is free of bugs. When we do more complex things, you will see more bugs as a result of it. That's the, it's the same trade off that you see in application code. Um, now this is definitely a feature that was worth it, but this is one, this is one that, that scares me a little bit more because it, it, gives an, it, it gives an unbounded growth to the maintenance burden of the migration DSL in the future. So, uh, Getting into a little bit more directly usable things, uh, we have a new method in Active Record Base called accessed fields. And what this method will do is tell you all of the fields that you've ever accessed on a model. So if you have, let's say, a user, and we'll assume that there's a column called name, and you new it up and you call accessed fields, you go back an empty array. And then if you ever access the uh, name field, and then you call accessed fields, you'll get an array containing name. So uh, why? Um, so this is a, a useful, this is sort of an experiment to try and help people get out of some very common performance pitfalls. And one of those is we don't ever call select in, unless we're adding something new. But even if you're only accessing the name field on user and user has 65 columns on that table, we're never calling select. And part of the reason that I've seen people avoid it is because it's a pain to maintain. Uh, you, you don't know in the controller all of the things that the view is accessing. So I figured let's give people a tool that maybe makes it a little easier to, to do this. So you, what you can do is you, in an after action, call access fields, take the result of that, copy paste it, call select, delete the after hook because you don't actually want that. Uh, and then if you, ever, if you ever change the views and you're, and you're getting exceptions about, about accessing non-selected fields, then you just do it all over again. Uh, and I was going to add a like, bullet-like gem that just gives you a warning, hey, you're only using 60% of the data that you accessed. You can probably gain some performance just by doing this one really easy thing, this one weird trick. Um, the reason I didn't was because I forgot until I was writing this talk. So I will probably do that next week. <laughs> <laughs> it actually turned out this feature was just really trivial to implement was the other reason that, uh, that we added it. Um, after all of the work that went into 4.2 to, to revamp our, our type system in, prep in preparation for the attributes API, uh, we ended up with a method like this. We have a class called attribute, and uh, we, a we actually do define not or equals because if you, th the value is nil or false, but it was expensive to calculate. We don't want to recalculate it over and over again, but this was fit better on a slide. Uh, but the important point being that there's an instance variable on this that represents the, uh, the value of an attribute after it's been typecast. So we can just tell if it's been read by seeing if that instance variable is there or not. 
Uh, so, and we just have this method here. This is the, the exact implementation of it. We have a class on top of that that acts as a collection. It tells you all of them. It, it, it was just it was about two dozen lines of code total. So let's select a little bit less data. Now the tools are there. So booleans are a thing. As I randomly skip around here, um, can anybody tell me what the value of this boolean field is after that assignment? Because we obviously match this regex. It's, it's a it captures struct yeah. or something. Right. And then when you assign that to a boolean field, exactly. The problem here is that the matches method will return a match data stru uh, struct. Uh, and we're assigning that to a boolean field. Now, the way the active records, well, this originally came, uh, a friend of mine named Jeff, this is what he looks like. He, uh, he asked me, hey, I've got some code that looks basically like this, and uh, it's, it's, it's matching, it definitely matches, but the field is false. What is going on here? Uh, and this one, by the way, different method, not matches. My first advice was like, oh, try calling dot matches instead. Uh, this one doesn't work either. It returns the uh, index of the first character that matches it. And in this case, if, if it happens to be the second character in the string that matched, it'll return one. And so that'll get cast to true, and every other number will get uh, cast to false. Because, and actually, this, one's, this particular one is still, is still dangerous. Uh, this was the correct answer. This is the only method on regex that tests whether a string matches it and returns an actual Boolean. Um, and the problem was that in our Boolean type, we had a whitelist of things that were truthy. So these are all the things that active record considered truthy. Um, I actually don't know why tr the word true or the word on are there. Uh, the, the, the string one is, is because that's what the form builder is going to give us. Uh, the string T probably doesn't need to be there, but it likely was used at some point in the past when it was accessing the database. I think actually maybe on it comes out of Oracle. Um, anyway, the problem is, right, this isn't how Ruby works. We don't have a handful of values that are, that are truthy. Uh, we have a handful of values that are falsy. So in Rails 5, flipped it around. So these are the values which are false. We have the, our blacklist. And that's why that, uh, the, the, the squiggly operator is actually still dangerous, because if the first character of the string is the one that matches, it'll return 0. Um, but we, we, act, we do need to cast 0 to false. So that, uh, that one's unfortunate. But uh, in general, this should help uh, get rid of a, a few more confusing semantics. We, don't it quite map to Ruby's truthiness exactly, but we're, but we're truthy by default now uh, and not falsy by default now. Uh, and don't worry if you're in, if you're in the back freaking out like, oh my god, but we're assigning things to our uh, we're assigning like some regex capture to uh, our is admin field on user, and now we're going to make everybody an admin. Uh, you would have gotten a deprecation warning. Uh, this this change went into place actually in 4.2. Uh, well, not by default, but we started uh, looking to see if there was a value that was not in that, in that explicit whitelist and was not in the explicit new blacklist. And if there was an, a value which would have changed, we would have given you a deprecation warning. And there's a config option you can set in 4.2 for it. Um, yeah, so that will, that will uh, ho again, hopefully be a feature that you never ha uh, have to see because we just don't have some confusing semantics by default. So that is, uh, I'm a I've gone a little short on time, but those are the features that I want to share with you today. Um, I would like to just take a moment while I have a captive audience to plug uh, the, the project I've been working on. It is called Diesel. It's an ORM for Rust. You can find us on the internet. I also have stickers if you would like a sticker. Um, and yeah, I will take questions now if anybody has any. Thank you very much.